morning. I'm Andrew Topp with Investing News Network, and I'm here with David Morgan, renowned silver expert and publisher of The Morgan Report. David, welcome. Thank you. It's great to have you on the show. So industrial demand for silver fell by 6% in 2012, according to uh, Thomson Reuters GFMS. But they're also predicting a 7% increase in industrial demand in 2013. So do you think industrial demand will cause the price of silver to go up this year? You know, all prices move on supply and demand, or they should anyway. And so silver doesn't care what the demand is. You know, demand is demand, whether it's investment demand or industrial demand. So anything that adds to the demand side will have an effect on price eventually. The problem being that there's so much, you know, derivatives out there in the gold and silver world and other assets that it gets distorted from time to time. But overall, yes, it'll be bullish. Do you have any predictions on the price? I do. I think we're going to see. I want to be conservative this year. I missed it last year in the early goings. I corrected myself in March, but a few people seem to forget that. Uh, this year, I think we're going to break out probably above 40, and I'm looking for a test of perhaps the $48 level a few times. Now, whether or not that happens, who knows? If it does happen, I really don't see it getting above the $48 level that we've already been to and staying there. But again, I think it could be tested there. It's very tough, and I will give better data when I have more information. Anyone that does what I do, I can only give you an overall view right now. But as I get more information and I see what the volumes are and you know what's going on in the market, and maybe this thing with the Bunza Bank and Germany wanting their gold and all the stuff that goes factors into the market, that is why you know you subscribe to somebody like me is to get information that's more pertinent. But for a broad brush swath. Yeah, I think it's going to be a bullish year for silver. Assuming that the price does go up, how would you recommend investors take advantage of the increase? Would you say they should be buying physical silver or ETFs or individual mining stocks? Great question, and I want to be consistent. I've always maintained if you don't have the metal itself, first start with that. But really the best area by far right now is the mining shares. And the reason being is the discrepancy between bullion prices and mining share prices are at a 30-year low. So if I could come to you as an investor with some experience and say, look, you're buying something that only happens once every 30 years, that's how rare it is, you might be intrigued. But investors don't. I mean, we're at a very low, much of a bottom. Is this the exact bottom? I don't know. I know it's bottoming and it's a good time to buy, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of interest in the mining equities, but that is a place to be. Okay. Now, a U.S. court recently dismissed the silver manipulation lawsuit. Uh, did you have any thoughts on the lawsuit? Somewhat. When it came out, I was a little uh, unhappy that the, uh, all the plaintiffs were put into one pool and it became a class action rather than a case-by-case -case basis. And it did pretty much what I had already forecast, which is that it's extremely difficult to prove manipulation in the eyes of the court. It's not too tough for me to see it going on, or a lot of people to see it going on, but to absolutely prove it is pretty darn difficult the way the legal structure is set. And because of that fact and knowing a bit about the law, I was a little hesitant to say, boy, this, you know, I was hoping or that it would. It doesn't surprise me in the least that it was dismissed. And there probably will be another you know, run at it, I'm sure, but uh, who knows. What's next uh, for the people at GATA and others who are trying to prove silver manipulation? They'll probably go back and you know, sharpen their pencils and, and resubmit another suit under you know, more stringent legal conditions and perhaps uh, you know, get it submitted and I think they'll have another run at it, uh, what the outcome will be. I again would guess strongly that probably would maybe not get dismissed, might even get a hearing, but to prove manipulation is just very, very difficult. Uh, so you know, I'm on that side that the major trend cannot be manipulated. Free market forces are still strong enough that we have a major bull market in gold, major bull market in silver. But from time to time, these paper derivatives drive the price down sharply for basically no reason other than to get the prices down. Yeah, okay. Now, there's been a lot of talk recently about high frequency trading and how that impacts markets. Now, how would high frequency trading be different from the big moves, as you just suggested, in the markets that some say are suggestive of manipulation? Well, allow me to use my hands, but uh, 
High frequency trading just takes a little clip, 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 clip. Yeah. A little bitty part, you know. I forget the name of the movie, but it was a, you know, it was a banking movie. It was a, a comedy, and they got like point oh 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 one cent out of every transaction. It's time billions and billions of transactions. That's sort of a metaphor for how high frequency trading works most of the time. So it matches orders, and it can distort the volumes, and it can distort the market somewhat and at times it could have a big sway but that's rare so it's something that you know goes on does it have a huge effect i'd say not really um, does it have some effect yes it does at times it can have a fairly noticeable effect but that's rare in the high frequency trading it really doesn't have a major effect unless there's a gap and that does happen once in a while the gap means that i want to buy silver at 30 and you want to sell it at um, at the market and all of a sudden those orders match and there's no orders in between and that order gets filled and it instantly goes back the next trade to where the silver price was just the trade before which for example might be 33.20 so on a chart you see 33.20 33.20 bang a drop to 30 back up to 33.20 say, oh my god what happened well it was like one lot one contract that got filled because someone was stupid to put in a not a limit order but an open market order yeah. it got filled and the market goes on so can it have an effect yes does it have a major effect no okay so just turning to the u.s economy u.s uh, auto manufacturing has been coming back recently and housing prices are stabilizing housing starts are up uh, what happens to silver if the u.s economy grows by say three to five percent this year well silver has like a dual personality Silver is good, a good metal in good times and a good metal in bad times. So if we have a, a true recovery in the housing sector and the auto sector doing what you, what you forecast or what's being forecast, uh, it's only be beneficial to the silver market. So I'm all for it. And I do hope we have a recovery. I'm still you know, putting on my economics hat, suspect. But we, I think we all want that. Whether or not it manifests or not, time will tell. But if it did happen, it certainly would be more, more pressure on the silver market. There's a lot of companies exploring for silver here at the Cambridge House Show. Um, how's it going to be for silver exploration this year? Do you have any predictions? For silver overall, I think it'll be a good year. I don't think it'll be the greatest year. I think it'll be a good year. That's silver. Obviously, the equities are undervalued. I think they'll do well this year, much better than the last two years. And for exploration specifically, there'll be some good ones. But it's we're pretty much past that part of the cycle. The best time to be in exploration companies were 2000 to 2006. And from that time on, you really should be in companies that our producers are very, very near producing. Uh, not that you should, you know, if, I mean, I'm free market. Someone wants to buy a ton of exploration companies, go ahead. But the part of the cycle that we're in is not favorable to those type of companies. So I would be a little, very, very choosy if I were going to recommend or generally, in a general way, say, hey, get into an exploration company. Be careful because it's very tough to get financing. A lot of the discoveries that have been made or the big ones are made. Will there be another one or two? Yes. But the odds are against you in exploration right now. Again, it doesn't mean you have to stay out of that sector, but think these things through. Know where we're at in the cycle and, you know, invest appropriately. Do you have any specific companies you might want to recommend for investors at this time? Well, I'll tell you one that I am not holding currently that I think is a good group of guys that are on the exploration side. It's LT Gray. They're here at the show. Um, you know, no kickbacks, nothing. I, but I like them. I like what they're doing. The drills are pretty good. You know, it's hard for me, as old as I am, to look at some of these drills with like two ounces of silver per ton and people getting excited when, you know, it was more like 10 or 20, you know, in the old days. But it is what it is, and uh, that's one to have a look at. There's a few more. In the Morgan Report, we are pretty specific and don't like a long list. But, uh, you know, I'll give you that one. It's fine. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, thanks, David, for sharing your insights with us today. It's been very, very, very interesting. And I've been Andrew Topp for Investing Insights. Thanks for joining me.